When you become a believer of Jesus Christ, and he starts to change you from the inside out, you begin to see the world a little bit differently, and you begin to take a, an emphasis on wanting the world to be a reflection of how Jesus was. And when that starts to emerge, you, you start to see the world, and when you live in a place that has the opportunity to vote, you start to have an inspiration for change. And that is a great thing. But you see, there's a trap that's involved with that. What do I mean by that? Well, in today's world, and I want to specify that this is a very specifically um, given to the West, but overall throughout the world, there is a large trap when it comes to the voting process. What I mean by that is that culture has now made it to a standpoint where, where we must align with a specific political party. And what's wrong with that, you might ask? Well, when you read the word of God, we are made very well aware that there's one rule book that we must follow. And in that rule book involves us, yes, serving God and, and serving the government and being respectful and, and those sorts. And we'll be discussing that later on. But above all else, our rule book stems from, from God. He is our ultimate authority. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord God Almighty. That is whom we must serve with our lives. And so when we go into this new culture, which has become you are a this or you are that or whatever those two specific party political groups are in your nation that you are listening to this in, you begin to live your life along those lines, that rule book. How I know that? Okay. Let's say you align with one political party. What news channel are you watching? Is it the one of, of your preferred political preference or is it of the other one? And how about your social media following? Do you follow those that are aligned with your political view or the other? How about your friend groups? Yes, this has been something that unfortunately has taken a hit and so many people have now been judging friends based upon who they vote for and that starts to become who you associate with. You see, all of those things I just listed are actually things that we should be doing from the Christian worldview. And so what's happened in culture now is that we've allowed ourselves to say, you know what? Our political party is now becoming the source of which we live our lives. Our political party is now the foundation that influences what we watch, who we listen to, who we walk, who we hang out with and associate with. That's not what the Bible commands us to do, folks. Those things are not what should be influencing our life. We should have everything be stemming from the word of God instead. And there's a massive problem with this. We have been, we have fallen for the illusion that one party or the other is a perfect party. So many people are, are all in on a political party in which you see no wrong in that party. Let me tell you this just, just straight up. There is no political party in the world that is perfect. I know this because I know that no human being is perfect. And I know that every political party is ran by people. Therefore, no political party is perfect. No matter how great you think one political party is from the other, no political party can be perfect. They are all broken parties. I know one group that is perfect. That one perfect group, the one that has the perfect rule book for society, that is the word of God and God's kingdom. And that alone. Therefore, what is starting to emerge in our world is that we are identifying one political leader from a political party to be our quote unquote savior. Why do I know this? Well, let's look at life. We all look at problems that we look at in this world today. We're going through life and this might be a stance that, that you just do not like. You want this to happen. You want this to happen. You want that to happen. And you want help. You are desperate. You want, you want change for these other reasons. And so you look to somebody to put your faith, to put your trust that that candidate will fulfill your desires and make life the way you want it to be. You know, people have been saying that since the beginning of time. Biblical times to modern times. People have been pointing to human beings to be their savior. But guess what? The Old Testament never got to experience and know of a savior. They knew of one coming. And then us, we've only experienced one, but he has been in the past. And that is the name, and his name is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That is the only savior. And so when we become what is you can call now is, is actually a legitimate thing that people can look at, it's called political idolaters. It is idolizing one person above God because you believe that that person is now becoming your savior, will change your life and make it for the better and so on and so forth. That is an inaccurate statement to have. Because no political candidate will be the one in which influences your life and changes it so that it is the solution to life. There is an answer though to that. And that is God and God alone. 
So what do we do about that then? Well, first of all, we need to stop having the stance that a political candidate is your savior. Because they're not going to fit exactly what you want. There's only one that can fill you up entirely. You cannot idolize anything above God, and we know that biblically true. And another approach you can look at this is saying, hey, all right, so we've gone through life. Why can't I, why can't I have the hope and the desire that, that, that this candidate can save me and change my life and so on and so forth? Well, I know this. I know that today there are problems in the United States of America, as there are problems in everyone in the West, everyone in the East, everywhere across the entire world. There are problems that people can complain about. Just as there were 50 years ago and 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So what is the problem? Well, let me give you guys a little bit of insight. We are likely the problem. We're not living for his glory. When the church decides to give our lives fully over to the kingdom of God, and we start to unify, unify together and become one, the nation typically begins to follow in that footsteps. Because here's something that we learn in the word of God. We read that the God of the universe, the all God almighty, throughout scripture, he's done many different things in his time. One of which we've read in the book of Samuel, I believe it happened specifically, but there's been other times throughout the word of God. God has utilized his power to confuse the land. And what this means is he brought chaos. And there was so much chaos going on within the land that people didn't know what was going on. There was wars, there was anger, there was outcry, so on and so forth. And people had no understanding of what exactly was going on at that point in time. Chaos that could not be solved. The word of God claimed that that was God bringing the chaos due to the people's hearts that turned away from him. God has the power to do that. And to give you guys a little bit of insight, there is nobody that will be able to outsmart, overpower God. Because if you are against God, they can't help you. Only God can save you because he is the only savior. So I want us to remember this part. In a democracy, we are the ones that elect the people that go into office. Think about that real quickly. I want this to really settle into our minds so that we understand this. Because I know a lot of people right now, specifically in America, will say, hey, these candidates aren't the best candidates in the world, so on and so forth. That's a lame excuse. Let me just be honest with us. Because the candidates that are elected are a reflection of who we are as the people. This goes all the way back to the primaries, go all the way back to whatever section in which these people were elected to represent you and your political party that you want to associate with. Those people are a reflection of who you voted for as a group of people. And so if you don't like the candidates in place, that's ultimately at the end of the day a reflection of who we are and, and what we did. And that's not something that we can take lightly because that falls on us. And so what needs to happen is this from a church worldview. When you look at it from a biblical context, as a church, we need to address us first. We know that as believers, we can't go into the world and change everybody's minds. We know that only Jesus can change us from the inside out. We need to be the fruit. We need to be the light in the world and bring fruit and provide fruit into this world. So what needs to happen is that us as the believers, as the church, we must go forth into this world. And we must pray, not only for the leadership involved and in place, but we must pray for the church. We need to pray for us to get right and bibliocentric, and the nation can then change. Tony Evans says this, it's a very great quote, until God can fix the church, he won't fix the nation. Let's look at the church today. A lot of people are in the church are, are, are getting divided. A lot of people within the church are, are getting divided politically in other aspects and ways. If we as a church can't unify, if we as a church cannot take the word of God and apply that into our world and be a proper reflection to the world to see what the Christian life is supposed to be like, then how can we expect God to fix the nation? As a, We need to look inward first. We can't expect there to be a godly, God-fearing man that's going to uphold the word of God or woman to be a person in office if we as a church can't even instill that in us to help us to actually reflect the word of God in our lives. So what we need to do is we actually need to start living by the word of God. And based upon that, then go forth and make our decisions based upon the Bible. And here's something I want to clarify. It's not your version of the Bible. It's not your translation or made up things or what you want or desire, but what the word of God states. You see, I see so many people in today's world 
you form an opinion based upon your lifestyle and what happened in your life. And you say, I want this to happen because it makes me feel good. Guys, when we surrender our life to God, our lives are no longer supposed to be a life about what our desires, our wants are supposed to be or what others think about us. What we need to do as the church is we need to say, hey, you know what? I surrender my life to you, God. What your word says is the word that I'm going to live out. That is surrender to God. And so what we need to do is we need to evaluate the word of God and live out that. It's not based upon a candidate's appearance or their party, what they align themselves with. The only thing is that if they are upholding the word of God. And this is another key point I want to turn to. Just because one claims to be a Christian does not mean that they are a Christian. That's not what we look for. You could be any religion in the world. You could be the, the, the most hardened heart against God in all of the world and claim to say you are a Christian. You could put Christian in your bio. You could even put a verse in your bio. What does that mean? It does not mean that you are saved. No, what we must look for in candidates is this, the fruit, their evidence that they are walking with Jesus. It doesn't matter what one claims to be. It doesn't matter if they just have a Bible that they're showing or displaying. Is there fruit from their lives? Are they actually reflecting God in the way that they live their life and the decisions that they make? Are they upholding the word of God? And, and real quick, let me stop you right there because I know a lot of people listening to this right now are quickly grasping and thinking of their opposite person, which they are voting for. Stop right there. That's looking at the world from a, a, a outside looking approach. Look inward real quick. Evaluate who you think you're voting for. Is that what they uphold? Do you see the fruit from their lives? And I've alluded to this. If that's the answer and you don't see any of the candidate being that in whatever country you're voting for, that's a reflection of where the church is or where the world is in that nation. So your answer very well could be right now, well, I don't have a candidate that is th that description. So what needs to happen then? Yeah, the selection might happen. Yes, there might be a person in office that does not represent God. We'll discuss that in a few moments of how we address that now. But what does that mean for us? As a church, if there is not a candidate in which reflects the people and the personality and the likeness of, of Jesus, then that reflects on the people and us. So what we have to do as a church is we need to get us right first. If we get the church right, the church reflects Jesus. We are upholding his word. We are upholding the ways of his life that can make true change. And then actually a candidate that reflects Jesus could possibly be somebody in the future. Now I was reading through Proverbs and, and I came across something that made me think about today's political world. Another point to look at when you're evaluating this voting process, because this was something that, that really got to me. It's Proverbs chapter 17, verse seven. Eloquent lips are unsuited to a godless fool. How much worse lying lips to a ruler? Lying lips of the ruler. Proverbs 17, verse 7. Let me reread that one more time. Eloquent lips are unsuited to a godless fool. How much worse lying lips of a ruler? When we look at the world today, politically speaking, can we all agree that there's a lot of lying going on? It God says that you are unsuited, lying eloquent lips are unsuited to a godless fool. How much worse are lying lips to a ruler? The worst above all else is a ruler in which lies, and yet we look at the political world and anywhere in the world, and all I see is a lot of deceit going on right now. Regardless of the political canon which you want to look at, we can all admit that there's a lot of lying going on within that branch of, of that group that you're voting for. And yet we read right here, how much worse lying lips to a ruler. That's not the way we should be living life. Bible reference reads this, and I want to read this quote exactly as they write it out because I think it's perfect. Solomon reiterates the idea of words that don't fit by speaking of rulers who tell lies. In fact, lies from those in authority are even less appropriate than arrogant speech from foolish people. It's beneath the dignity of such a position to be deceptive or dishonest. A ruler who deals in lies is worse than a fool because his foolishness harms those over whom he has power. Because Isaiah chapter 32 verse 6 reads this, The fool speaks folly and his heart is busy with iniquity. To practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to deprive the thirsty of, the drink, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. 
when there are candidates out there currently in this world that decide to go out there and pursue lying, that decide to utilize a, a, a this method of lying and deceit to help them get themselves into political gain in office. And yet at the end of the day, the only people are hurting are those that voted them in. Every branch that you look at in this world today, there is a massive problem with deceit and lying. We can't deny that. Many people look at politics around the world and, and can quickly look at it and say, hey, there's a lot of stuff I don't like going on that. And yet we read scripturally based how bad it is in multiple verses, multiple chapters, New and Old Testament, how bad it is when we see these things approach in our world today. Because we can't deny there's hypocrisy in both sides. But yeah, at the end of the day, they're the ones representing us. And as I said many times before, this only shows that at the end of the day, we must change first, because ultimately we are the ones allowing the political decisions to overrule our biblical decisions. We need to sit back down as a church and evaluate this world top to bottom and make sure that we change first, because if our mindset is at this position of life saying, hey, our political decisions will be overriding and overruling our biblical decisions, that's not good. The order of operation that we need to be having is that our biblical decisions overrule our political decisions. That must always be first. Bible, and then every other decision we make in our life. I've talked about talking to Tony Evans before, and he has another quote that I love. And this is why I think the answer ultimately is this. There is no party in which we can claim to be God's party. Therefore, the church should not back a party. As I said, Dr. Tony Evans says this, God is not a Democrat or a Republican. He doesn't ride the back of donkeys or elephants. So he is the consonant independent. I think that's the safe answer to say, folks. Look throughout the word of God. Where are you going to find the answer that God is of a party in any country? You're not going to find that. Because God is his own branch. He is the rule book. He's the ultimate authority. He's the land, law of the land. And only he is the perfect law you can possibly follow. Therefore, aligning yourself with one party or the other is a very, very scary line to get into. And that's what I'm diving into right now with you guys. There's a study that's been done by Dr. James Mumford. He calls it the package deal ethics. A direct quote from him describing this issue in the world today. Let me read this for you guys. The great curse of our generation is how such polarization is warping the way we think through our deepest moral dilemmas. When it comes to ethics, we find our answers too readily and unthinkably and unthinkingly according to which side of the political spectrum spectrum we see ourselves on. Values, convictions, ideals, positions on the most momentous debates of the day. Beliefs about what should and shouldn't be done all get bundled into liberal and conservative package deals, which then we buy into. This is why it's a very scary line to draw and we must draw this line as the Christian church. When we associate with ourselves and bring ourselves underneath a political branch, it is a very, very scary line to be a part of. Because when you do that, this is a truth. The package you ethics, I already broke down before. Why? What political party do you align with? And who are you following? Who do you think about? Who do you hang around? What do you watch? Are those all in alliance with what your political voting theory will be? And if that is the case, that's a very, very not okay thing to be a part of. Because at the end of the day, we know that I said God is ultimately an independent. He's in his own world. He's in his own lane. He does not back either party. And when you back a party, that means that you essentially are agreeing with everything because according to the package deal ethics, you are bound to that party in every train of thought and voting process. No matter which way you view your life, whatever, whatever occurs, you will be influenced the direction that fits alongside the lines and the code lines of what a political party wants to suggest you do. And that's not okay because as believers, we are supposed to, and we are called to live our lives according to Christ. Therefore, our voting theme must be based upon the biblical worldview that honors Christ and Christ alone. So now we get to this position. And I can see some people are probably overwhelmed. You could see yourself in a position where you say, hey, you know what? It's a lot easier if I decide to say, you know what? I'm not even going to vote. I don't even want to be a part of the political process. It's too confusing. I don't want to go through all this work. That's also in the wrong. Cliff Connectly, he went on saying a very, very good quote. I want to read this as well. Not being political is also not an option because you're saying that you embrace the status quo. That is not okay because when we embrace the teachings of God, that means that we must get involved in situations to glorify his word. 
Because let me tell you guys the truth. The world is not perfect. There is change and we need to be a reflection of God. And right now, the world is not a perfect reflection of God in any way, shape, or form. And we can go back in history. Let's go back to Germany, Nazi Germany. You don't think there were Christians out there that needed to get involved? That could have made a stop politically? Slavery. You don't think that could have been somebody that Christians should have been able to step up and stop that? Any issue in this world has called for us to make an, make a stance. Biblically speaking, many, many people are persecuted for their faith. You stand up for what is right and what God calls you to do, no matter the cost. So saying you're not going to get involved in change is not something that's going to be okay for you to align with. David Guzik says this, in a democracy, we understand that there is a sense in which we are the government and should not hesitate to help govern our democracy through our participation in the democratic process. I've said this multiple times. And I think this is a key point for us to look at. We must know the word of God, follow the word of God, take the word of God and apply that into the world that we want it to be like. If you live in a nation in which you have the opportunity to vote and you are voting based upon personal preferences, you're in the wrong. It's not about that. If you are a believer, you are to follow the word of God and what God calls you to. So that's the voting process for you guys today. But as I alluded to, what happens now when this election is over? Now what occurs? What do we do now? What if either one of the candidates, if you're in America, are not the one that you want, and neither one's going to reflect God in the ways in which you want him to do or her to do? So what? Here's what the order of authority says in the word of God. Submit to governing authorities. This is something that is key. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, it reads this. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to, be, to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of consequence. This is, why, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities that are God's servants, who give, you, who give their full time to governing, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So yes, we're supposed to submit to the authority. But here's the key point I want to bring to, to you guys. That actually comes second. Because Acts chapter 5, verse 29 reads this. We must obey God rather than human beings. All right, well, governing officials are human beings. They're placed in place by God. But ultimately, the, the law of authority and prioritization in our lives must be God's word, then the governing of the bodies. And so what do we do then? If we cannot obey God, if there is a law, a land that you live in currently that prohibits you, that limits you from your walk with God, or even influences a way of the demonic way of life that does not uphold the word of God, then what do you do? Well, here's Acts chapter 4, verses 19 to 20. And let me break this down for you guys, because I think this is critical for us to hear. I, I, I remember reading the story once before in my life, but I never broke it down. didn't have a full grasp. did not know it very, very well. And I broke this down in the study, and this blew my mind. Let me set the scene for you guys before I read the exact verses of Acts chapter 4, verse 19 to 20. The apostles, they are disobeying the law of the Sanhedrin for healing and preaching. They were put into jail. So these people were out here preaching. They were they were doing this law against the law. And they're not supposed to be preaching the word of God, but they're healing by the power of God working in and through them. They were preaching the word of God and how good he was. And they're put into jail. They're sitting in jail now. And the angel of the Lord of the Lord opens the door and tells him, hey, go preach about your new life that I've given you guys. Keep doing it again and again. And they don't go hide. They go right back into the court land of the law of the land. And they start preaching again. The, the king and all these people come back again. The Sanhedrin comes back and, and, and they're looking for these people and, and the jail doors unlocked and they, they find them just, just preaching again, which they were just were arrested for right in the middle of the town. And they catch them, they bring them in and, and they bring them right in front of the high priest and they answer this. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you 
or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And let me tell you guys this. What happens when they tell the, the governing bodies about this? This answer resulted in them wanting them to be put to death. There was such an outcry immediately when they responded by this saying, hey, we're not going to follow your rules. We're going to keep preaching the word of God. And guess what? It is what it is because we serve him instead of you. At the end of the day, that's how the order will go. And, and the, the, the governing of bodies said, no, that's not okay. I want to kill them now. Put them to death, they say in the verse. But they negotiated and they decided, you know what? No, we're just going to go flog them. And that's what they did. And they said, okay, we're going to go flog them. They did so. Obviously, that's whipping them. Not a pleasant thing. And they tell them, hey, go out now. You're gone. You're free to go. But do not preach anymore. And they let them go. What is the very next move that happens in this verse then? It's just beautiful. Their response in verse 41, this is what scripture reads. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. They were just flogged. They were just whipped. They were just beaten. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They were just whipped. They were just beaten. And yet they turn right around and they are rejoicing because they were worthy enough to be going through punishment in this life for God. And so they rejoiced in that fact. Verse 42 says this, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You guys understand this real quickly. Let's bring it back down again. Already were arrested, were beaten, whipped, let go, said, do not do this again. Otherwise, you probably know what the punishment is. And guess what? You just also survived not being put to death. And now guess what? You guys can go out, but do not do it again. And you already knew in your mind exactly what would occur if you did so again. Did not stop them. Not only did they not stop them, they were proud of it. They rejoiced because they were worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. That is the mindset which we must have as believers when we approach these things. When it involves politics, what we must do is that first and foremost, we're obeying God. It doesn't matter what the status, what the, what the status quo is. It doesn't matter what people may think or judge you as. As the body of Christ, we need to look at the word of God and say, you know what? My view, my, my worldview is a biblical worldview. What the word of God says is the world is the way I want to view the world and the way I want the world to look and reflect. That is who I'll put priority. Number one is God. Secondly, I will respect whoever is in for, whoever's in power and authority over my life. And we do this joyfully, knowing who is ultimately in control of our eternal life. Let me say that one more time. You do this joyfully. There's going to be a lot of people in this nation, in any nation around the world, that their candidate that they will select is not going to be elected. And what we've seen historically is that immediately following that, and possibly for the next four years, there will be bickering, complaining about one person put in place or not in place. Joyfully, after the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had just counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Our job doesn't change regardless of who gets placed into office. What your life calling is going to be is the very same. You're, you're, the ultimate king of your life is not changing because God's not going anywhere. He's not giving up on you. He's not leaving. He is still an ultimate authority. He still has your eternal life locked into his hands and giving you it, the opportunity if you give your life to him. So don't for a moment think that no matter who gets elected in your country, that all of a sudden you must be bickering, complaining of who is an authority, but rather reflect on that, recognizing who ultimately fault it is. And secondly, reflecting on saying, you know what? But ultimately God's an ultimate authority over everything else. I don't have to fear nor worry about that. Let that be the mindset we have, regardless of what occurs politically when the elections emerge. Because he is an ultimate control. Above all else, we follow God's word. And I know we're going to say this. Well, God's going to allow bad candidates to rule. How could God do that? How could we turn against God and allow ourselves to elect somebody that doesn't follow God? And you could say, well, how about in, in, in countries that have dictatorships, that have horrible situations going on in those nations? Truth be told, of course, that's not the way that God intended any of this to be. But what I do know is that in all those countries, there's a lot of people that's also trying to pursue God. Now, the nation as a whole has not turned to God, but we see that people still have a pursuit of him. And that doesn't change regardless of where you are. Because ultimately, God placed in authority people to carry out his plan. We know that scripturally based. That everybody placed in office 
is ultimately according to his plan to carry out his ultimate plan. And so you might ask real quickly, well, well, wait a second. So you're telling me it's his plan that this nation might be destroyed, that this nation might happen? Yes. I'm going to go biblical on you because I can't utilize modern day times because it's not in the Bible. So I want to say biblically based on everything. Biblically speaking, his own people, the Israelites, time after time after time, they disobeyed God, they turned the hearts, they hardened the hearts against God, stopped serving him, and God allowed other kings and nations to overtake them and conquer them until they returned to God and gave their lives back over to him. Time after time after time, this happens in the Old Testament with the Israelites. Why? Because it was to carry out his plan to ultimately bring his people back to him. God appoints a nation's leader, but it's not always going to be to bless the people. Sometimes it is to judge the people or to ripen the nation for judgment. Yeah. A lot of people right now will be saying, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a second. You're saying it's possible that could be us? And I'm assuming that when you look at us, that could refer to anybody in the West, which would be perceived as one of the most powerhouse countries and nations in the world, could God tear them down? I don't have the answer for that biblically, but what I do know is I do know throughout the Bible, many of the great nations fall. I know that historically, every great nation has fallen at some point in time. I know that God does not change, and he's taken down nations many times beforehand. Because no nation is above the rule or rulership of God. A nation's power is nothing compared to him. He's allowed many great nations to fall before, and there's no reason he won't continue to do so. What we do know is it's not scripturally based, but we do know that in the time of Jesus and, and everything going on there in the, in the New Testament, we're talking about the Romans. One of the greatest empires ever lived. I don't see them anymore. I see a nation in, in, in rubble that we go and see for, for amusement. I don't see them any longer being the most powerful nation they once thought they were that, that decided to go kill Jesus Christ. That is why we must follow him and his word and his word only. And then follow the rules that the leader puts in place, unless it goes against his teachings. We must remember that the scripture I just read about and talked to you about in Romans, that when Paul wrote those things, it was during the Roman Empire. It was not a democracy. And it was most certainly not a special friend of Jesus and the Christians. Yet he still saw the legitimate authority. William R. Newell says this, your, your savior suffered under Pontius Pilate, one of the worst Roman governors Judea has ever had. And Paul under Nero, the worst Roman emperor. And neither our Lord nor his apostle denied or reviled the authority. So what do I know about this? What I do know is that yes, when a nation historically based has served God and have upheld the word of God, they have been at their best. They have done things, they have done the unthinkable. They have conquered great things, overcome incredible things that most people could not fathom or imagine. That has happened in the United States of America, that has happened throughout all the West. When the world and the nation has been based upon the church, great things have happened. Is that where we're at today? The answer is for us to decide. There was one political candidate I will mention in this episode. I said, I'm not going to do any current, but there was one political name I will list. President Abraham Lincoln. It's hard not to respect him as he certainly had a, a sins like every human does. But what I do know is this. His mindset was what we should have as a mindset in how we approach the political process. They were at a point in time going to war and a priest approaches him and asks him, should we pray that God is on our side? Abraham Lincoln responds with this, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always right. Let me reread that quote one more time for everybody here in this right now. My concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always right. So many of us like to say, God, be on our side, be on our side, be on, be on our side. No, God's saying, come to my side and let you see the great victory of his name. Don't be calling God and just saying, hey, God, help me have what I want, what I want, what I want. I want this political candidate. I want this to happen. I want this to happen. What God is saying, hey, no, 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 no. What does my word say? 
pray my word, pray my heart, have the heart that I have, want what I want, desire what I desire, and that is what I will bestow upon you and I will give you that. If we have that mindset and we evaluate the word of God, we evaluate, then take that word of God and we apply that into our political process and thinking, we can then quickly determine what God's heart is. And that can lead us in the right direction. Therefore, this answer comes to a conclusion. Should the church as a whole vote for the same person each year if it is truly led by the spirit in the word? Yes. God is spirit. He's all places, all times. If you are truly filled by the spirit of God, that would be the same spirit in each and every single one of us. And if we truly take our time and listen to God and what God has placed on our hearts to follow exactly what God calls us to, the church would be in unison. However, let me emphasize this extremely clearly. That is not the church job of the church to come out and proclaim who to vote for. When the church at large proclaims a certain candidate, you are bounding everything wrong that I just discussed with this entire segment. A church or a pastor or anybody in, in a form of position or leadership within the bounds of a church should never be one to come state exactly where and how you should vote. That is for us to evaluate, use discernment from the word of God to then go out and speak. The reason why it's not okay is because of everything I listed plus this next factor. We know that voting one way or another is ultimately not a direct sin. Now our minds have gone to a position where we've said that essentially our voting process is one of the biggest cardinal sins somehow. What you vote for is not directly a sin. Now you could say based upon what a political party is trying to do could result in a sin later on happening, but that's a very long story to get into that, that we don't have biblical truth in regards to. So if we're treating, when all sins are equal, and yet we're treating supposedly voting as if it is a sin, when it may not even be a sin, that causes anger. It causes treating someone unlike Jesus would, and that's a problem. Your voting process should not cause you to sin. If that does, then that's a problem as well that you must evaluate yourself with. If you're going to utilize voting in the political world to create anger, to create a, a, a distaste towards somebody, to treat someone like Jesus would and cause you ultimately to sin, then you need to reevaluate yourself. Because that's, that's not the position of life that God calls us to live. All it's going to do is cause division, which is the opposite of love. And that's going to happen both within and outside the church. If a church wants to proclaim a person to be the candidate in which they're going to follow, and yet they're going to go live a life and, and, and make that the end all be all of the church. That's going to hinder a lot of people from walking with God. We must evaluate ourselves first before we ask and want the rest of the world to change. We must funnel every action, thought, etc. that is politically through the word of God. And we cannot allow the politics to become our savior or idol. Uphold only the word of God just as we should do in every area of life. Our job is to vote and is to uphold his kingdom. And we must do this from a humble position of what his word desires and calls us to, not our thoughts, not our wants, not our desires or our preferences, not how we will be viewed or how others will look at us, but how God calls us to live. That is the only way in which we should approach the voting process. No other way, just what God calls us to live by. That is how a Christian should approach the voting process in the political world, by being kingdom-minded. 